2024. Professor Jeffrey Sachs joins us today. Professor Sachs, a pleasure, my dear friend. Thank Great you to be with you. Thanks a lot. Thanks for taking the time to join us. Which country is the worst enemy for Ukraine, Russia or the United States? Well, uh, I, I say the U.S. because uh, the U.S. sweet-talked uh, Ukraine into disaster. Uh, what I've recently written is that uh, we uh, I told uh, Ukrainian uh, leaders uh, lots of uh, fairy tales about uh, how they were going to join NATO and live happily ever after. And it was uh, a, uh, a great illusion uh, that we sold to Ukraine, not for Ukraine's sake, by the way, but for the sake of uh, U.S. Uh, aggressive foreign policy, what we call neoconservatism. Uh, the idea, the plan from the 1990s onward was that the U.S. would assert its unipolar, dominant, hegemonic, uh, primacy position in the world, and it would do so in part by extending the U.S. Uh, military uh, to uh, all regions of the world, including surrounding Russia, including possibly breaking up Russia. And Ukraine was a major part of that strategy, which dates back, incidentally, to 1992, to ideas of uh, Richard Cheney, who in 1992 was the defense secretary, uh, and of course, who in 2001 became vice president of the United States. Another part of this neoconservative plan uh, was to overthrow governments that the United States did not like. Uh, and that included the wars of choice in Iraq, uh, in Syria, in Libya, uh, and a coup uh, that the United States actively participated in in Ukraine in 2014. So we sold uh, a fairy tale to Ukraine. Uh, the Ukrainian leaders bought it. I have to say, I've been telling them all along, uh, though they didn't like to hear it from me, that's for sure, that we were on a path to make Ukraine the Afghanistan of Europe, as I frequently called it. By that, I meant uh, a country devastated by a U.S.-provoked war of choice because the U.S. overreached what it can do at the great expense of another place on the planet. So this is the sense that I uh, said that Ukraine uh, exemplifies a, a, a often quoted uh, aphorism attributed to Henry Kissinger, uh, attributed, uh, by the way, by William Buckley from a conversation with Kissinger, uh, in which Kissinger said to be an enemy of the United States is dangerous, but to be a friend is fatal. This is uh, probably and, uh, this is probably the classic, even though they're both have passed on, the classic example uh, of that. I mean, you're familiar with the inch and a half thick agreement that Ukraine and Russia negotiated uh, in Turkey in March of uh, 2022, initialed by the Russian and Ukrainian uh, negotiators. Uh, which would have uh, prevented 10 million people from fleeing Ukraine and a half a million Ukrainian soldiers from being killed or seriously uh, wounded. Uh, Ukraine's uh, infrastructure would still be uh, intact. Uh, the Russians would have their comfort zone and there would have been no NATO. Now, if that happens, it's going to happen after 10 million people have left and after a half a million people are dead or seriously wounded and after the infrastructure uh, is destroyed. Do it's, exact, it's exactly right. Uh, exactly right what you're saying, of course. And it also reflects a certain attitude because those in charge in the United States will shrug their shoulders and say, well, we tried. They don't count. The dead. They don't count the losses. They don't count the destruction. They're not held accountable for this. To make these points, one is accused of uh, being a Putin apologist uh, rather than actually knowing the history and knowing the facts. 
because we're in the world of spin. So the world of spin says that uh, what Russia did in February 24th, 2022, uh, that is uh, its special military operation was unprovoked, the word we've discussed many times. That's the spin. The fact of the matter is it was provoked and it was entirely avoidable. Uh, and uh, this is what is so tragic and what is still playing out. Now we see, and it's alarming, we, we actually do not have a president who can negotiate right now. Uh, I've been saying every day negotiate. We saw in the debate, uh, it, it actually probably literally could not happen right now. Uh, this is completely alarming. But Ukraine we, do is have, we do have a secretary of state who has rejected his core responsibility in that job, which is to communicate with other high ranking diplomats of other countries so as to minimize a war and minimize killing rather they don't even talk i mean the secretary I, I, of defense spoke to the russian foreign minister of defense after the killings on the beach in sevastopol uh, i guess because uh, the the foreign minister of russia warned the u.s ambassador to russia tell your guys back in washington we are no longer at peace this is, uh, of course, something that is stunning to see. I, I had a personal experience in this. I was uh, invited to speak to uh, a group of foreign ministers online, and uh, that included uh, uh, the Russian foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov. It included uh, Antony Blinken, uh, the U.S. Secretary of State, and it included mm -hmm. other leaders. And, and when I joined online, uh, first, it uh, became apparent to me that the uh, G7 foreign ministers were literally uh, not speaking one-to-one uh, -one or directly, let me say, with Lavrov, even though they were in the same room. Uh, it was so contrived. Uh, it was uh, like a, you know, a junior high school clique. Well, we're, we're not talking to them. Uh, he, he's, he's on the other side. When was and, this, Professor? Uh, yeah, I don't want to get too specific, but uh, it was uh, during this period from 2022 onward, okay. uh, the, the war was raging, and um, there was an occasion where I was invited to speak. And uh, it's amazing to me uh, how grown-ups can act like children uh, and worse because uh, I'm often reminded children don't act so badly. But uh, <laughs> if, if you're in a room together and a war is going on, you talk with each other. You don't make it the point precisely, we don't talk to the other side. This is what has been happening in this world in recent years. I put a huge responsibility for this on Blinken because as you said, this is his job. He should understand his job is to talk to, quote, the other side, even an adversary. He is our secretary of state. He is our chief diplomat. We can't end these conflicts other than through diplomacy. We are not ending this on the battlefield. All we're doing on the battlefield is ending lives. This has to be ended through diplomacy. And the idea, which is uh, sometimes said, well, you can't talk to them, they're evil. They won't keep their word, there's no diplomacy. The, there's no possibility of diplomacy, excuse me. This is so factually wrong, it's unfortunate to say it's almost the opposite. If you ask between the US and Russia, who has kept one's word and who has not? It is not Russia that is the one that repeatedly has violated its word. And so the idea, well, that side's so evil that we can't even speak to it, is not only wrong as a principle of how to search for peace, 
but it's factually wrong in terms of what has actually transpired. Because by my count, and I've been there at a lot of this in in direct uh, role and seen it, it was the United States that promised that NATO would not enlarge. That goes back to 1990. It was the United States that told Mikhail Gorbachev and told Boris Yeltsin, no, now we have a trusting mutual relationship. It was the United States intercepted in the phone call between the Assistant Secretary of State Victoria Nuland and the U.S. Ambassador to uh, Ukraine, Jeffrey Piat, in January 2014 that was plotting the post-Yanukovych government. How dare the United States plot the government of Ukraine on a phone call, by the way, that was intercepted by the Russians and posted online for all of us to hear. It was the United States that exceeded, supported diplomatically in the UN Security Council the Minsk II agreement and then privately said to the Ukrainians, don't do it. You don't have to do it. It was the United States that rejected diplomacy at the end of 2021. It was the United States that intervened, as you said, to stop an agreement in March 2022. And then we say there's no one to talk to. You can't do diplomacy. They don't keep their word. By the way, on strategic issues, that is nuclear arms issues, it's the United States, not Russia, that unilaterally abandoned the anti-ballistic missile treaty in 2002. And it's the United States that unilaterally walked out of the intermediate nuclear force treaty in 2019. Oh, my God. Well, I'm not saying the other side is perfect, but the idea that we're so pure, they're so evil that we don't even talk. This is absurdly opposite to the truth. 